would like to use for a subject today, Lord, build that wall. Lord, build that wall. Somebody say it with me, Lord, build that wall. Today's message is largely inspired by one particular current event that has captivated the dialogue of our country. One of the hotbed topics of late is the building and debate about building a border wall. Proponents of the border wall argue that the building of a wall would diminish the threat to safety, security, and well-being of the citizens of this country. These same proponents suggest that the country would be better able to control who moves in and who moves out of the country with said wall in place. One particular individual who remains the driving force behind the building of this wall is quoted as saying, and I quote, simply put, walls work and walls save lives. However, on the opposite side of the spectrum are those who disagree with the need for a border wall. These individuals would argue that to build such a wall would first of all be enormously expensive. Opponents also argue that such a wall would create an increase in policing as would-be immigrants would seek other methods and other means by which to gain entry. A negative impact on wildlife, wildlife migratory patterns, water flows, genetic diversity in natural species were other reasons why there are those that oppose the building of a border wall. But central to their argument against the building of such a wall is the suggestion that walls are divisive and do not project a welcoming image to this country in the eyes of the rest of the world. Now, whether you agree with the necessity of this border wall or not, if you were to look around and pay attention to your surroundings, you would find that we all live and work and and in many cases congregate behind walls. When we lay our heads down at night, we lay our heads down behind walls. And we do not lay our heads just behind walls. Many of us, we go so far as to lock the entryways to those walls by making sure that our deadbolts are engaged and our door locks are locked. We also, so many of us, go a step even further than that, that when we lay our heads down, not only do we lock our doors, but we engage, we activate, we turn on security systems. Because we want to make sure that when we are sleeping, when we are slumbering, that there is no uninvited guests that come into our abodes. Many of us even pay a monthly fee to have a security company manage and monitor those systems so that if something were to happen while we were in our homes, local authorities would be notified. We all live with walls. We all congregate behind walls. We even worship in between walls. We're going to find, though, in today's story that there is a need for a certain kind of wall in our lives. Whether you believe it or not, this is the kind of wall you want in your life. When it's all said and done, I believe that many of us will declare to God and outright say it out loud, Lord, build that wall. If you would, look with me in Job chapter 1, verse 6. It says in this verse, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. This verse alone destroys many false notions about the enemy. As we can see here in Job chapter 1, verse 6, Satan presents himself to God as do all of the angels. Let's be clear about something right now. Satan already knows he's defeated with God. 
Satan already knows he's fighting a losing battle when it comes to his fight with God. He got kicked out of heaven because he tried to run up against God. But what we're going to see is God in his conversation with the enemy is who Satan really has the problem with. Look at verse 7, Job 1 verse 7 says, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. Now, the word of God backs what the enemy just said here is if you pull up 1 Peter 5 verse 8, we'll see that 1 Peter 5 and 8 backs up what the enemy just said to God because it says here, be sober, be vigilant. He's talking to us because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Notice how Peter in his letter to us says that the devil is our adversary and not God's. Notice Peter also says that the adversary is doing exactly what he told God he's doing. He's walking about. What's he walking about doing? He's walking about seeing who he can attack, who he can devour. So by his own admission now, the enemy says to God in Job 1 verse 7 that he's walking about the earth and he's now trying to look for somebody that he can attack. Jesus in John 10 and 10 said it this way, the thief does not come except for three reasons, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But let's get back to our conversation that God is having with Satan. And if you look at Job 1 verse 8, we're going to see something interesting here. Uh, Job 1 verse 8 says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Job was minding his own business. Job, Job was doing everything he knew to be right. Job was praising God. Job was honorable before man, as even God himself said. But look what God says. Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? I would like to submit to you that the reason why some of you may find yourself under attack right now is because just like Job, God has served you up to the enemy. Maybe the reason why you're having challenges in your life right now is because God has called your name out from heaven and God has told the enemy that you won't find nobody like my son or my daughter. I believe that maybe we ought to consider that maybe the possibility that the reason why you're having the troubles that you're having is because God has spoken from heaven and he said that if you were to test this one, if you were to test that one, you will find that their love for me is legit. I believe God has called some of our names out and he's called our names out to the enemy and said, I dare you attack them because even your attack won't stop them from serving me. God wants to prove to somebody, including the devil, that your love for him is legit and your love for him is real. So, 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 so look at this. Look at this. Go, go with me to Luke 22. Luke 22. How do I know this is possible? In Luke 22, verse 31 and 32, Jesus says the exact same thing pretty much to Peter. He says in verse 31, and the Lord said to, and the Lord says, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. Here again is further proof that any attack levied against you has to be done with express permission from God. Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Look at verse 32. But I have prayed for you. Wait a minute, Jesus. That's all you did for Peter? All you did was pray for him? Look at what he says here. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Notice Jesus did not stop the enemy from attacking. Jesus said, here's what I'm going to do for you, Peter. I know what's coming. I'm just going to pray that you don't fail. I know the attack is going to come your way. I just pray that you maintain your faith when the attack comes. Go back to Job chapter 1 because there's something the enemy says in verse 9. He says, so Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? This question suggests that some believers only serve God as long as God has given them stuff. <laughs> this question suggests to us that 
as long as God has given me money, I'm good with God. It's, this question suggests that as long as I got a nice house to live in, that I'm good with God. This question suggests that as long as I got a car that still runs and I got a job that keeps money in my bank account and I got food on the table and I got clothes on my back, that, that I'm okay with God as long as everything is working in my favor. The, the enemy, the enemy, he asks a question, does Job fear God for nothing? Then it's in verse 10 that our adversary says something that should give us all pause to praise God. I know somebody's thinking in your mind, how is it that anything that the devil says should give us reason to praise God? He is the author of confusion. He is known to be the father of lies. What can come out of the devil's mouth that will make us want to praise God? Uh, I suggest we look at this together because watch what he says in verse 10. He says, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? H hidden in this question uh, to God from Satan are two compelling questions that I got to follow it up with. Again, the enemy says to God, have you not made a hedge around him and around his household, and around all that he has on every side. I, I had to ask a question, Minister Davis. I had to ask the first question, which was, how did Satan know that there was a hedge around Job? Uh, this suggests to us that the enemy had contemplated and maybe even attempted to attack Job, but he could see that there was a hedge around him. And I would like to submit to you today that the enemy knows who's protected and who isn't protected. The enemy knows who's covered and who isn't covered. The enemy knows who God is watching over and who God isn't watching over. The enemy says to God that not only did I see a hedge around him, but look at what he says here, and around all that he has on every side. Which begs the second question, how does the enemy know that Job is covered on every side? Unless he attempted to attack him more than once. And God wants to say to somebody in here today that he's been covering you more than you realize. That he's been covering your front and your back. He's been covering your right and your left. That's why you ought to say, Lord, build that wall. But notice now, notice now, from the mouth of the enemy, <laughs> this isn't God talking, this is the mouth of Satan. He says, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? Three reasons why we ought to thank God and three reasons why we ought to say, Lord, build that wall. First reason is, with God's wall comes protection. With God's wall comes protection. Go with me to uh, Psalm 91. Uh, I, I was looking at Psalm 91 when God took me here, and I, I was trying to uh, just get a couple of these scriptures out of Psalm 91, but the more I read it, the more I said, no, this fits too. And I, I said, well, maybe I ought to stop at verse 4, but then I read verse 5 and 6. I said, no, this fits too. And, and so I just got to read it in its entirety. Psalm 91 says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. How many can say God is your refuge? And my fortress. How many can say God is your fortress? My God in him I will trust. Verse 3, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. How many know you've been delivered from the snare of the fowler? And from the perilous pestilence. Verse 4, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror of night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near to you. That's worthy of a praise right there. Verse 8 says, only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. Verse 10, no evil shall befall you. That's worthy of a praise. Nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. That's worthy of a praise. Verse 11, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in 
at all your ways. I don't know about anybody else, but I thank God that God has put some angels charged over me to watch me in my coming and in my going. There are some angels assigned to you, and with those angels being assigned to you, when you come and when you go, God says, I got you covered. So from the devil's mouth, he says to God, <laughs> you made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side. But then the enemy gives us another reason to be thankful. He gives us another reason to want to say to God, Lord, build that wall. He goes on to say, you have blessed the work of his hands. The second reason we ought to say, Lord, build that wall is with God's wall comes provision. David in Psalm, in the Psalm to God, he said it this way, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. How can David say that? Because when you're behind God's wall, God makes sure he takes care of you. I don't know about you, but... When you are behind God's wall, God always has a ram in the bush because Jehovah Jireh will always provide for you. When you are under the protection and covering of God, God will always make sure that in a drought situation, you got rain. It'll be just you and God because you are covered under God or across the street. They might still be in a drought, but rain is happening on your yard. God will always make a way when you are behind his wall. When you're under the covering of God, God will always make sure that he takes care of you. Like the prophet Elijah, he found this out that he was sitting under a tree. He was ready to die, but yet God said, I'm still covering you. I'm still your wall. I'm still your provider. He sent ravens with meat in their mouth to feed the prophet. How many of you know that God will find a way to provide for you in other ways that most people don't get provided for? Because because when you are behind his wall, God's got you. Somebody say, God got me. So you're protected because of God's wall and you're provided for behind God's wall. You're blessed when you're behind God's wall. When you're behind God's wall, everything you touch is blessed. Then the enemy says something else in verse 10. He says, God, you bless the work of his hands. And his possessions have increased in the land. Here's the third reason you ought to say, Lord, build that wall. From the enemy's mouth, we see that when you are behind God's wall, you will prosper. Psalm 35, verse 27 puts it this way. It says, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. You prosper when you are covered and protected by God. And God takes pleasure in blessing those that aren't afraid to serve him. God takes pleasure in blessing those who aren't afraid to say that they are in a covenant relationship with God. It's no wonder why some folks don't like you and they don't even know why they don't like you because they can see the favor of God is on your life. There's some folks right now that are seeing what God is doing in your life and they know you make the same amount that they make and yet you got more. It's not because of what you're doing. It's because of the favor of God and you're behind God's wall. There's some folks that are trying to figure out how are you driving, what you're driving, how are you living where you are living. It's because you are behind God's wall and God always takes care of his people. Man, I'd like to submit to somebody in here today, your children ought to be thanking God for you because they're covered because you're covered. <laughs> Your children's children ought to be saying, thank you, Lord, because not only are you covered and not only are your children's covered, but your children's children are covered. Because when you are behind God's wall, he doesn't just protect you. He protects all of your people. He protects all of your children. He protects your generations from here until forever. And so notice, notice now, notice now. Somebody say, Lord, build that wall. Because something happens in verse 11 that the enemy says to God and he suggests something that I think we ought to be made aware of. Look at verse 11. He said, you done blessed his hands. You got him covered on every side. But watch verse 11. He says, but now stretch out your hand 
and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Essentially what the enemy was saying to God was, Job only loves you for the stuff you give him. Job only comes to church because when he comes to church, he gets a blessing when he gets home. That's that false religion a lot of people have. Job is only dedicated to you, God, because he's driving nice and he's living nice. Job, Job, Job only celebrates you, God, because times are good in his life. And I believe the accusers made similar claims about some of God's people that are here in this place today. I believe the adversary has said to God, God, if you take the house, watch their worship change. God, if you mess up their relationships, watch how different they are in your presence. I, I, I dare you, God, I dare you take the job, the home. I dare you touch their body and make them sick. I dare you do it, God. Watch how their worship changes. But I believe we're going to make the devil a liar up in this place because I believe there's about 50 of us that don't matter what our situation is. I dare you to get on your feet and let's shame the devil and give God some worship up in this place. I dare you to praise God because not because of what he's giving you but because he is God. I need somebody to worship God not because of the stuff but because God, you've been good to me in the good and in the bad. Whether I got a job or not, I'm still going to praise God. I don't need a mansion to praise God. I'm happy with the two-bedroom apartment I got, and he's still worthy of my praise. I don't need a Porsche or a Maserati. I'm happy with the Hyundai I got, and I'm still going to praise my God. So watch verse 12. Watch verse 12. <laughs> because verse 12 totally destroys some religious views that many people have about Satan. Verse 12 says, and the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. The word power is translated as hand. So again, it says, all that he has is in your hand. Only do not lay a hand on his person. The word of God here just lets us know that God just let the wall down around Job. It's here that God now says to the enemy, that you can attack him because I'm giving you permission to attack him. Stop going around telling folk the devil busy in your life. If he's attacking you, it's because God has given him permission to mess with you. And if he's messing with you, it's because the, God is trying to prove to the enemy that no matter what happens to you, you won't change your mind about God. So we got to give the power back to God who is the one that allows access to us. God tells Satan, I'm going to let you get to Job because you're going to see just how serious Job is about his love for me. I believe God has done the same with many of us. God has lowered the wall. And he's allowing all hell to break loose in some of our lives because God wants to prove to Satan that even when all hell is breaking loose, they still going to come to church. <laughs> I believe God is trying to prove a point that Satan, you can attack my daughter all you want to, but when it's all going down in their life, her hands still go up. I believe God has said to Satan that you can do what you want to do to my son, but I'm going to promise you one thing, that when you do it to my son, he's still going to remain dedicated, determined, and dependable when it comes to serving me. Lucky what he, watch this, watch this though. Go, 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 go to Job chapter 2 because, because the attack comes in different forms. And then oftentimes, the struggle, Deaconess Rogers, is when this kind of attack takes place. Look at verse number 9. Uh, most times we're cool when the attack comes from a stranger. Because <laughs> I don't know you. Most times we're cool when the attack maybe even come from a co-worker because you don't like me anyway. <laughs> but when the attack comes from somebody that you love, it's a little harder to deal with. Look at verse number 9. Verse number 9 says, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Just a little warning for, for you, God's people. You got to be prepared for people, even the ones closest to you, to question your commitment to God. But watch Job's response, which is found in verse 10. He but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. 
Y'all don't mind if I put that in our modern day language, right? Woman, you sound like a fool. Or better yet, let's go even to the millennial language. Girl, bye. He says to his wife, shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? It's here in verse 10 that we can see why God had a wall around Job. Because even when his wife questions his integrity, Job, regardless of her questioning, still holds fast to his faith. We also see why God is still blessing Job, even though he's going through what he's going through, because Job was willing to glorify God in the good and in the bad. God isn't just God when everything's all right in your life. God is still God when everything isn't all right in your life. God isn't just God when you're sitting on the mountaintop and you got more money than you need. God is still God when you're in the valley and trying to scratch two nickels together. God is God when you got gas in the tank and God is God when you don't have gas in the tank. God is God when you got a job and God is God when you don't have a job. God is God when you got friends and God is God when you got nothing but enemies. God is God when you're sick and God is God when you're healthy. God is God when you're living nice and God is God when you're barely, when you're worried about the neighborhood that you're living in. God is still God. It goes on to say in verse 10 of Job 2, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Praise the Lord. Well, we know his story. He, he's attacked on every side from Satan. Job is attacked financially. He's attacked physically. He's attacked emotionally. He's attacked spiritually. He's attacked from every way because God allowed it to happen. Jump to Job 42. Jump to Job 42. Something about Job that just, it blessed me. Something we can learn from him. Job 42, let's look at verse 7. Somebody say, Lord, build that wall. Verse 7, verse 7 says, And so it was, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Ooh, look at verse 10. I'm about to run up out of here. Now, therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams, Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. Ooh, I'm going to read that last part again. And my servant Job shall pray for you. Sam, you're going to get it on the way home. And my servant Job shall pray for you. Well, well wait a minute now. All hell is breaking loose in Job's life. And God is sending people to Job to pray for them. Good God Almighty. Job needs the prayer, but God is sending folks to Job so that he could pray for them. And God would like to submit to some to you that you, just like Job, have passed the test. I believe this was another test of God that God wanted to see. Could Job still pray for somebody else when he needed prayer his own self? Uh, God, God tested Job to see, can you help somebody else when you need help yourself? Job got tested by God to see because God wanted to know, can you be a blessing to somebody else when you need a blessing in your own life? We see here that Job has people sent to him so that he could pray for them, and Job begins to pray for them, and God is saying, I believe that some in here right now that you've been pressing through your tr troubles and your issues and God has sent some folks your way and you have still remained faithful and committed to pray for somebody else when you need it yourself. You've lifted somebody else up when you need to be lifted up yourself. You helped somebody else when you needed help yourself. You stood with somebody else when you needed somebody to stand with you. And then it says, in verse number 10, and the Lord restored Job's losses. Oh, you just missed your shout. And the Lord restored Job's losses 
when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. I'll try that one more time. <laughs> Maybe y'all just didn't get it right there. And the Lord restored Job's losses. Oh, Lord, build that wall. When he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. God wants to announce to somebody in here today that because you passed the test, he's rebuilding the wall around you. Somebody shout, Lord, build that wall. You were faithful while you were under attack, and now God says you passed the test, and the wall was going back up. Somebody shout, Lord, build that wall. You didn't waver when you were weak, and now God's about to restore your strength. Somebody say, Lord, build that wall. You didn't stop your worship when everything around you was falling apart, and God says, now I'm about to restore everything that you lost. Somebody shout, Lord, build that wall. Your family called you crazy. Your friends thought you were nuts, but God says because you remain faithful, I'm going to give you the last laugh. Somebody shout, Lord, build that wall. You didn't stop tithing. You didn't stop serving. You didn't stop believing. You kept on trusting me and God says now you're about to see me give you double for your trouble. Somebody shout Lord build that wall. Somebody shout Lord build that wall. Because behind God's wall we are blessed. Behind God's wall you're successful in everything that you do. When you get behind God's wall you're covered and you're protected. It's behind God's wall that even your family prospers. So I say to God, I don't know about you, but Lord, I don't care how much it costs. Build that wall. I don't care what the enemy says. Lord, build that wall. I don't care who gets mad at my prosperity. Lord, build that wall. And God, I don't care what it takes. Lord, I just want you to build that wall again. Because from the enemy's mouth, from Satan's mouth, he says to God, I can't get to Job. And God would like to submit to you that when he builds a hedge around you, the enemy can't get to you. When God builds a wall around you, all the enemy can do is be mad at all the blessings that God has got coming to you. So, Lord, make the devil mad and build that wall. Let's give God some praise up in this place.